Welcome to episode eight of the Audio Software Interview con uh, Podcast. This is Ryan Grant for Athanasius Contramundum, and thank you for listening today. Here we're joined by Father Chad Ripperger, who is well known in traditional Catholic circles. Um, he's the author of numerous books, some of which we'll talk about today, principally the uh, Introduction to the Science of Mental Health, um, Magisterial Authority, his most recent book, The Binding Force of Tradition, and several other books, which we'll talk about how you can find those at the end of the interview. So, Father, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Tell us a little bit about yourself for listeners who might not be familiar with uh, your background. Um, well, uh, I basically went to the um, University of San Francisco, where I did my bachelor's, and then to the Center of Thomistic Studies in Houston, where I got my master's. Um, I then did a short period of time, which most people don't know, I did a short period of time in uh, a New Right Seminary, but realized that in the end, um, even though it was a fairly decent seminary at the time, that in the end, many of the um, neoconservatives which were there were not ultimately committed to the truth. I'd always watched the traditional movement with um, a great deal of um, appreciation, so I always wanted to uh, basically be able to say the old mass and then it was at that time that I made the switch to the Fraternity of St. Peter, um, where uh, I was ordained, where well, I finished my seminary formation. I was ordained, completed my doctorate in philosophy in Rome under the fraternity, and, um, and now I'm working as an exorcist in the Diocese of Tulsa. Okay, excellent. Thank you. And uh, <clears throat> jumping up from there, since you are an exorcist and you've conducted various workshops on exorcism, let's go through the process. Somebody thinks they're possessed, and by whatever means gets to you, how do you determine if they're possessed? Um, the process by which they usually get to me, our preference is, because there's a couple of other priests that also work with me, our preference is, is that there's usually a local priest who's already looked at them, or the local diocese has already taken a look and made some kind of determination, although we don't take that as a, kind of an ironclad thing. So then the people will contact us. We'll talk to them for a little while. We have a bit of a vetting process because some people, you can talk to them over the phone and get a general sense that something is really more psychological than, say, diabolic. Then if we think that there is something there, we'll have them come for um, an evaluation. Usually it's about three days. They come, um, and if during that time we discover that they are possessed, then uh, we will begin uh, the actual solemn rite of exorcism with them. How do you determine someone's possessed? Well, the church itself has given in its, uh, in the ritual, it has given its, um, the criteria by which you can determine someone is possessed, of which there's four criteria. Um, the first one I'll mention, um, although these are not in the order that they're necessarily appear in the ritual, but the first one is that they have an aversion to the sacred. But you have to be careful with that because people can have a psychological problem in which they are averse to the sacred, and it's purely psychological. So, for example, if when a child is younger, every time he went to Mass, he got beat, well, when someone says, why don't you go to Mass, psychologically, he's going to associate the pain and the woundedness from having experienced that when he was a child, and he's not going to want to go. So, you can have something that's purely psychological. The other side of it is, is that, of course, demons, because of their um, rejection of God, they hate all things sacred, but that does not mean that each demon is, has an aversion or has different degrees of, they, they actually have different degrees of aversion to different sacred things based upon the sin that they committed. So in a case of possession, you can have somebody who can receive Holy Communion because the demon can kind of tolerate that, but he can't tolerate, say, holy water, or <coughs> he may not be able to tolerate um, the precious blood, but he can tolerate um, Christ under the aspect of, um, under the species of uh, bread. So you can actually have um, different, they have, so each demon has an aversion to something sacred, but not necessarily to all. It's a common misperception that people have, um, uh, you know, if they're possessed, that automatically they have an aversion to everything sacred. So if you use holy water and they can tolerate that, then they can't be possessed. And that's actually not the case. But that first category of aversion to the sacred, I, again, I don't take as an ironclad kind of a thing because, um, as I said, you can have people who have psychological difficulties or other issues in relationship to, to those. The next three, if you see them and it's clear, that is, you clearly see these three things, 
then you know for certain that they're actually possessed. The first is um, occult knowledge. They'll know things that there's no way that they could have known. And this includes everything from secret knowledge about, say, something that the, only the exorcist knows or the assistants that are there during the exorcism would know, that they, um, that they, uh, they know those things and there's no possible way that they could know them. Another form that I've seen happen on a few occasions is the person will be unlettered. They don't know hardly any theology or have no formal theological training. And yet when the demon manifests, he's making theological distinctions that there's no way that this individual could know. So that's one of the ways. Or they'll know things about other sciences that there's no way that this individual could know. You don't see that too often, but it does occur. So uh, hidden knowledge. The next one is... Um, the uh, speaking languages that they've never studied or known. And that's an important thing, too, because the principle of sufficient reason is very important in the area of diabolic influence. If something can, it, the principle of sufficient reason basically says, um, colloquially, it says you can't give what you don't have. So if you don't have the knowledge, there's no way you could speak it. Well, in the case of um, languages, if you've never formally study the language, there's no way you're going to be instantly fluent, uh, fluent in the language. From time to time, you'll hear psychologists say, oh, well, that can be explained away easily because the person may have heard, say, Latin or Greek or Hebrew or something like that at some time in their life. Okay, that's fine. They may have heard it. Hearing a language doesn't mean that you're instantaneously fluent in the language. And this is something that's quite important. So, for instance, in one case I had, the person had never studied language, the Latin language, and yet the demon spoke perfectly fluent Latin, and his, uh, the, the knowledge of the demon manifesting to the individual was evident because if I didn't, when I would speak back to him in Latin, if my grammar wasn't perfect, say I used an accusative when I was supposed to use the, the dative or the ablative or something like that, he would ignore me. So this is um, something that, you know, there's no way that this person could have known that to know those languages. And sometimes there's languages that people never hear and they're speaking fluently. So um, I had a case where a demon spoke a form of Phoenician, which we think had been defunct for about 3,500 years or more. Mm -hmm. So there's no way that um, he could have ever studied. And he himself didn't even finish high school. So there's not, you know, these are the types of things that you'll see. Especially given that uh, experts in the field of studies of Phoenician or the history of ancient Carthage or Tyre and Sidon don't know how that language is put together. Right, exactly. So when he spoke this language, I didn't know what it was. I wrote it down phonetically just to get a sense. I took it to an expert and he said, uh, we think this is how this particular language was um, uh, pronounced. And it's, it's a very different kind of a thing, you know, where it's not just some person speaking in tongues, which you put that in quote, where it's incoherent jabbering. Here we're talking about a very distinct structure to the language. You can tell he's speaking something, um, the language. And also, um, you know, they'll very often speak languages that they, um, uh, that I know, other languages like Italian or Spanish or something like that. Um, one thing that is often a misunderstanding too is, is that people think you have to have all four of these signs, which we're going to talk about, in order to be possessed. That's not tr true either because Christ will sometimes limit what the demons can and cannot do so he'll restrict them to certain languages. So you can speak to a language in, um, in say, like if you were speaking to him in German, um, and that Christ restricts him from speaking in German, he'll actually look confused because he can't, Christ is blocking him from being able to make use of that language. And that's something that is uh, not too well understood except for by fairly experienced exorcists. Mm. The other, the last category <clears throat> is things which are beyond human capacity. So... Um, a friend of mine who's an exorcist, he had a case of a 10-year-old boy who um, he himself is probably somewhere between 220 and 250, not head fat or anything, a very large man. One of his assistants was a, um, a very a, a, another large man, probably about the same weight, um, he was, who was a police officer. And this 10-year-old boy grabbed them both and lifted them both straight off the ground. So obviously this isn't something that's normally going to occur. Another, the most common kind of thing you'll see um, is uh, what I call morphing, which is where the person will actually change shape. We're not set talking about just making faces or, you know, contorting a little bit. We're talking actually changing shape. So um, in one case, um, the person uh, would actually change and his face would change into a wolf. He would literally look like a wolf. Another case that I um, assisted at where the woman was... Um, 
possessed by Lucifer, she'd changed into the her face would change into a rat, or um, but this uh, the uh, or the, one of the cases that I've dealt with, which has Beelzebub in it, he always manifests the same way when he changes shape. His jaw gets large, his head top of the head narrows, the eyes come close together, and he immediately change color. And so this is not something that it looks like a physiological structural change. It's not something that people can do themselves. That's the most common kind of manifestation you'll see. And these, those can go from being very subtle to so remarked that, um, for instance, one case I actually saw a woman change into a man. She literally looked like a man, even though she had a normal feminine figure. By the time it was done, she looked like a man. So those are kind of the things that are fairly common. Um, another one that you, that you see in Hollywood, but it's extremely rare, is levitation. I've only seen levitation in two cases of the numerous that I've done. It's not too common. It's not, um, but when it does happen, it's obviously not something that a human being can do. If you see one of those three, then you know for certain that the person is being influenced by, um, by a demon or something that's beyond uh, normal human capacity. Okay, excellent. And so along those lines, I guess that's going to draw a lot of uh, questions from people. Physiologically, how does that work that the demons can actually change our shape? Is it because the matter is malleable to a spiritual force, a spiritual force can actually change the matter itself? How exactly is the mechanism that they do that, or is it understood at all? Well, demons, because of the laws of nature, demons also are subject to the laws of nature in the sense that they can't do things contrary to physical laws. Because if they did, then they could do miracles, which is one of the things that they cannot do. St. Thomas says that in relationship to, say, like morphing, they can do one of three things. They can either, ch when the light hits the, the, the person as it comes off, they can change the light as it's transferred through the medium. So that by the time it gets to what you see is the change that's mm -hmm. occurred. The second is um, they can actually change it in your eyes. Mm -hmm. They can also change it in your imagination so that you can't really distinguish between what's in your imagination and what you're actually seeing. It just appears that way. Mm -hmm. So those are the three ways that they can actually do that. Indeed. So, but they're still they're still subject to the um, to physical laws when they're dealing with matter as well. Now they can right. with things that are pliable. They can move them around and uh, things like that. But they can't change bone structure or things like that. Got it. So there's another question. When you mentioned Phoenician earlier, um, one of my interests in studying Roman history is the impact of Phoenician on early Latin culture. And so I've been studying Phoenician as much as it can possibly be reconstructed. And there's so much they don't know. And all I can think of is if I was the exorcist there, eh, God forbid, and um, you know, the demon's talking Phoenician, I'd be tempted to just get it chattering and give me answers to questions I don't know. How do you, would that be divination and how do you avoid that temptation for the knowledge? That's exactly right. It is a form of divination because the definition of divination is seeking by the medium of demons knowledge that's, um, that's not property or state in life, really. And I think that it's usually driven by curiosity, which is also seeking knowledge that's not property or state in life. So in the case of exorcism, the church is very strict. You are not to ask questions that are not directly or at least indirectly connected to the person's liberation. Demons will often bait the exorcist by throwing little tidbits out about, like, say, the state of the church or something that might be, appear interesting, but it is not connected to the person's liberation, and you simply have to ignore that. Mm -hmm. Once the demons know you're serious and you're only going to focus on those things that will get them out, mm -hmm. then they usually won't try that tactic too frequently. Now, when I say directly, some, for instance, the church says that there's certain knowledge that you want to get, like how many demons there are, their names, what they, um, uh, how they got in, because sometimes that'll tell you how you're going to get them out. Uh, the so the cause of the possession, um, the time and uh, the time uh, and date of their departure, and then also uh, the sign of their departure. So those are the things the church tell you want to get for you know directly because those will tell you something about whether the possession's finished or where you're at in the relationship to it. Mm -hmm. Now sometimes you have to get information indirectly. So sometimes you have to beat the demon up and force him to think about his sin or things like that, which are not necessarily directly connected to it, but in order to weaken him, right. to get him to the point where then you can ask the question. Mm -hmm. that So if you, you know, um, but I usually don't go down the indirect path if the demon is already giving me the information. 
But if he isn't, then sometimes you have to kind of take an indirect route to get him weak enough to where he'll give you that other information. But it shouldn't be a, it shouldn't be a fishing expedition. You shouldn't be trying to learn about him. It should just be, what do I need to know to get him into a position what could give me mm. what I need to know to get him out? Mm. How can you trust that the information you're getting from the demons is true? Because a lot of people say, well, the demons are liars. <clears throat> Christ calls him the father of lies. Right. So how can you trust that he's telling the truth? For example, Blessed Jordan of Saxony, the successor of St. Dominic, was also an exorcist. And he relates various things that Satan told him about God's beauty and glory. And so the question then comes, well, is he lying? How do we know that any of this is true? Oh, that's a very good question. You know, it's kind of funny. One time I had a case of the Noonday Devil, which is mentioned in Psalm 90. I used to always think that the Noonday Devil was just a generic term for demons that would maraud during the day and cause people difficulties. And I found out that he's a real guy. And what was funny about him is that he, uh, one time my father said to me, he says, you know, there are certain people who will lie when the truth sounds better. And he was one of those guys. Even if it would go better for him if he told the truth, he would still lie because they're so committed to, to the falsity that they've chosen. But, um, and so they do lie. But there's a few ways that you can know. The first is the principle of coherence. Truth is coherent. So in other words, what it means is that all the different parts of what you hear will fit together if it's true. If it doesn't, you'll notice there's something a little out of whack or it doesn't sound quite right. And so um, as, an, as an experienced exorcist, over the course of time, you become fairly perceptive about being able to tell, okay, there's something that's not fitting here, and so I'm not, he's not telling the truth. Sometimes they'll tell you the truth, and so you'll, they'll say, well, you ha the person has to do this kind of, um, um, or they have to do this, they have to say this prayer, and then we'll leave. Well, then, if it's not contrary to theology, then you have them do it. If they don't leave, well, then you know they're lying. Um, another side of it is to, there's two other parts to it. The first is, is that some demons are just bad liars. I mean, they're like human beings in the sense that you can just look at them and when they're telling you something, you're like, okay, you're just telling me that because you're hoping that I'll let you off the hook. So you can kind of detect some demons that way. The other, the last thing, which is probably the most important, is the fact that because of the power of the church, which is being applied to the demon in solemn exorcism, the demons are forced to tell the truth. Now, as an ex experienced exorcist, you get to the point where you know how to employ that to where you can get the demon. And even though he might lie in the beginning, if you keep after him, eventually, just the sheer force of Christ's power operating through the church, which operates through the exorcist, who's just purely an instrument, then he will be compelled to tell the truth. So long term, you'll usually get the truth out of him. You just have to be consistent and follow those other principles like the principle of coherence and just watching for when they you know they're just lying to you because sometimes they're just bad liars mm. <clears throat> very very interesting so the next question then you often advocate binding prayers for people who believe they have problems with some form of demonic obsession um, yet it could some have said that recourse to binding prayers is like in modern medicine where you get prescribed all these drugs and they just mask the symptoms. They don't actually deal with the problem, which is usually rooted in something with nutrition or a habit of life. So in like manner, someone, you know, someone says X and Y binding prayer, but they're not resolving the fundamental problem. So shouldn't they just dispense with the binding prayers and focus on the root vice that that's the cause of their problems? And if that's the case, what's the use of binding prayers? Well, there is some truth in what you say. Sometimes people have an underlying problem, such as they're very wounded from, say, some past history, which the demon is kind of holding on to, or there's some vice that they're engaging in, and so they're trying to bind the demon, but they're still engaging in their vice. And in that case, what you say is absolutely true. Would you dispense entirely with a binding person? No, but it just means that you have to change what you're doing. In other words, you got to get, you have to heal. You have to get the, uh, if that's the problem, you have to stop the vice first to work on that and then in the process the other problem will be solved so in that sense what they say is true however demons can cause a person by constantly picking at them or constantly inclining them to a particular vice so one of the things that people will notice is is they'll spend years trying to develop virtue in an area and they don't make no progress because the problem isn't just a problem of the vice there's a spiritual component that is there's a diabolic component driving the thing and so they may not be able to overcome that unless they first bind the demon from causing it. Then they can develop the virtue and overcome it. And this is a very important point because sometimes if people notice that they've gone years trying to overcome a vice and they just haven't made any progress, 
That's a sign that there's a di it's a sign. It's not an absolute, but it's a sign that it could be a, a diabolic problem. So if you bind the demons, then it will have that effect of getting, keeping the demon at bay so that you can develop the virtue and then remove the thing that has his power over you. Mm. Father Gabriela Mort, in his notable book, An Exorcist Tells His Story, says that the devil is angrier over people who go to confession and confess their mortal sins than over souls being liberated in exorcism. So if that's true, what's the value and purpose of exorcism? Well, that's actually a very good question. First, what, he, what Father Amorth says is absolutely true. The thing that people have to realize is that sin, because it's a violation of the law of God, sin has a binding, a legal binding force to it. So that if you commit a sin, you're bound in justice to pay back to God. And so there's a, um, a, a binding force that it actually has. That other thing is, too, is when you commit a sin, especially a mortal sin, you place yourself under the demons, which gives them a certain authority and power over you. As a result of that, as long as you remain in the sin or hold on to the sin, what happens is, is then the, the demons still maintain that power and control over you. So when, you go, when the person goes to confession, I've actually seen this happen, where the, uh, the demon, you'll do exorcisms and you're not making too much progress, and then finally it comes out that the, uh, the person has some unconfessed sin that they've never confessed, and they knew they haven't confessed it, but they're still holding on to it. And as a result of that, the demon is holding on, and so you can't get him out. Once the person goes to confession, and the demons will all very often even try and block the person from going to confession or block them from remembering it or what have you. But once um, the person goes to confession, the binding force of the law is broken. It no longer has a binding force in relationship to the individual, and the demons are total legalists. Once they know that happens, they know that they have no more power over you in relationship to that. Now, they can try to gain psychological traction by picking at you, well, you still committed that sin, God might have forgiven it, but what kind of a person are you? That's a separate issue. You just have to deal with them in a, in a different way than that. But once that sin is confessed, then it no longer has any binding force. That doesn't mean, though, that, that, uh, p um, that exorcism doesn't have its place, because sometimes you have to do exorcisms for a while to get out of the demon. What is your, what's your power that you have over this? What's holding you there? And then very often they'll reveal, um, at a certain stage, if it is some particular sin, they'll reveal it, and then you can get the person to confess that sin, and then they will be... Uh, then just a few exorcisms after that, very often the person will be liberated. Mm. <clears throat> a lot of people are familiar with exorcism through popular media and movies, such as The Exorcist, or The Exorcism of Emily Rose, or the more recent film The Right. <clears throat> how accurate are these films in regard to how exorcisms are actually conducted? Well, um, different movies have different degrees of accuracy. Um, one of the difficulties with some of the stuff coming out of Hollywood is uh, artistic license. And I think that artistic license can have a place in certain areas. But in this area, I find that when they tend to take artistic license, two things happen. One is they tend to falsify and give people wrong ideas about how this stuff works, the sec which was clearly the case in the movie The Right. Deacons don't take an artistic license. The movie *The Right* was actually based on the on the on the um, the uh, uh, on a particular priest who was becoming an exorcist. And what ended up happening was um, they made it a deacon. Well, deacons can't exercise in the church. The church doesn't permit them to do so. So th those particular aspects are inaccurate. In the cases of possession, um, some of them are accurate to certain things, but not others. So take, for example, the movie *The Exorcism of Emily Rose* whose her real name is Annalise McHale, who's the, um, who I personally have a devotion to. I think she was a very saintly woman. Um, during her lucid period, she would spend times praying in front of the Blessed Sacrament, and she offered her possession up for the, uh, the suffering that she went through for the conversion of the clergy, which in Germany at the time, the uh, clergy were suffering a lot of difficulties during, um, during that period. But... Um, that movie was very accurate to a book called The Exorcism of Annalise McHale. It was, actually, it was accurate to the book. The problem is the book wasn't fully accurate. So, for example, in the case of Annalise McHale, she was, in fact, liberated of the initial possession. Then sometime after that, Our Lady did appear to her and ask her, would you allow this so that many would come to knowledge of these things? 
And she said yes. So she was actually accepting becoming a victim soul so that other people would benefit from it. So that there's some inaccuracies there. In the exorcisms, one of the problems with Hollywood is you have two hours to present, right, an hour and a half to two hours roughly, to present a theme and to give an arc, etc. The difficulty is, is that you can't give a full sense of what goes on in an exorcism, an actual exorcism, because in an exorcism there's beginning prayers where you... You pray to keep everybody protected. You pray to bind the demon from doing certain things during it. For instance, if he's violent, you bind his violence and things of that sort. And then you might do the solemn exorcism. Obviously, you're not going to do a full solemn exorcism in a movie because it would, the exorcism, if you read it from beginning to end, takes at least 25 minutes. So you're not going to burn up 25 minutes in a film. So they'll cut bits and pieces of it. So it gives people the impression that you just do a few things and all of a sudden the demon's gone. And that's not necessarily the case either. There's also some things where... Um, people will think that, so for example, in the movie um, the, uh, the Exorcist, that it was the priest basically getting angry with the demon, and that was when the demon um, and ask, you know, telling him to transfer to him, and when he came into him, then that's how the woman was liberated. And that never happens. It's called, the technical term for that is called transference, where the person tries to take on the possession and it's transferred to the other individual. That never happens. The church strictly forbids it, and the reason being is because of the fact that when people try to do transference, you don't end up with one person possessed, you end up with two people possessed, because the person has opened the door to the demon coming into them, and they still have possession of the other individual. So, in relationship to the Hollywood um, things, um, there's a lot of inaccuracies. There's also tends to be a bit of um, uh, sensationalizing of certain elements of it in order to sell the movie to make it interesting when in point in fact most exorcisms are pretty mundane yeah you might see morphing and you might see things like that but it's a it's a grind it's not you know all this stuff happening all of the time so but some of the movies are more accurate than others um the movie the exorcist is fairly accurate to the historical case fairly though, though there's again areas that aren't um the Exorcism of Rose is fairly accurate. The movie The Right is very inaccurate. It actually bears very little resemblance even to the book The Right upon which they um, based it on. Um, and so you just have to be careful. It's also the case with some of the movies that they're coming out with, especially in the paranormal areas, um, and also where they're doing things without really consulting experienced exorcists, those movies are, by and large, inaccurate to how things occur. Like Poltergeist or something like that. Yeah, Poltergeist is somewhat similar. I mean, there's some accuracies to things like that. But, um, yeah, you'll see a lot of things happen, um, and they say, you know, uh, or, or yeah, they'll say, that, you know, this particular thing happened, or they'll portray it in a particular way, which there's no way it could ever happen that way. That was my experience in watching the movie The Riot I, as I was walking through it. You know, at least 60% of the stuff that they portrayed in there is not accurate to the way mm -hmm. things normally occur. Um, however, and there's also a lot of misunderstandings in Hollywood about the natures of these things. So very often they don't know the distinction between a ghost, which is a disembodied soul. That's somebody who's died, who's in purgatory. Um, at least that's the general consensus among um, experienced exorcists. Um, as opposed to, say, a demon who's very... Uh, malicious and does a lot of bad things. They don't make those distinctions. They don't understand them. A lot of that is also, too, driven by um, people who are doing paranormal investigation. Their understanding of those things is not at all rooted in a Catholic tradition, which has a very good knowledge of this because it has the experience of centuries. And so it's over the course of time, and a lot of it is revealed by Christ to the apostles and passed on um, through tradition. And so they have a very false understanding of these things. Mm -hmm. Since I mentioned the movie, movie The Poltergeist, are there real poltergeists? There are houses. Those things actually do occur. Um, but they're usually not as severe as what you will see in those particular things. The demons can pos take possession of a house. It's the technical term for that is infestation. They do can take possession. I've dealt with a few of those particular cases. Um, but they're not that common. Um, very often things will happen in homes, but the actual the demons attach to individuals in the home, and so when they move from home to home, the demon falls them and they experience them in different homes, and it's not the actual home itself. Sometimes it is the home um, where certain evil things have been done in the home, and as a result of that, so for example, if witchcraft, um, in one case that I dealt with in a home, which was actually the most difficult case I ever dealt with, 
with a demon in possession of a home. It was a demon of illness. He had taken possession of the home. When a family moved in there, he literally started causing illness and moved up the chain, killing the dogs and things of that sort. So those things do actually happen. As far as things moving around and stuff like that, yes, that does happen where people, one case I had where cell phones would move around, they would hear knocking and things of that sort. But again, it's not that common. Hmm. Many traditionally minded Catholics would be interested in knowing whether the new exorcism ritual works that well or not. <clears throat> in your experience, is it effective? What are the differences between that and the old ritual? Well, the big differences, which actually there's some good literature that's actually been out there. Um, Manfred Hawk wrote one on it. Um, Father Amorth has pointed out a number of different things. Other exorcists who have done detailed analysis have showed difficulties with it. As Amorth have pointed out, there wasn't any experienced exorcists on the New Right um, Council that put that together. And so as a result, there's a lot of misunderstandings about how things function. So, for example, one of the things is they call it a celebration. Well, I don't see how torturing a, an intelligent creature to the point where he's in so much pain he gives you information and he gets the boot is considered a celebration. <laughs> um, however, it's... Uh, so or another thing is they have you blessing holy water during the exorcism. Well, sometimes the demons will start manifesting right off the bat before you even begin the exorcism. You don't have time to do those kinds of things in there. But the two big differences, I think, is, is, in, is in the tone in how the prayers are written. In the old rite, it's the church is very serious. They know that they have the authority to get this guy out. They go in and... The exorcist prays to St. Michael. There's some other prayers that are said, like the Psalms and things of that sort. And then you immediately go into exercising, and it alternates between what's called deprecatory prayers, where you're asking God to give the person relief and power. And then uh, a large bulk of it is imprecatory prayers, which are said to command the demon to do certain things or to say certain things or to leave. And so that commanding that is a sign of the power of the church, the authority of the church over the demons, which Christ gave to the church. And as a result of that, the, um, the demons, generally speaking, and this is the common experience of most exorcists, although there are a few that have a, lot of, uh, a fair amount of success with the new rite, is most exorcists who have used both clearly say that the old one is far more efficacious because I think it's, it's much more direct and it's much more commanding of the demon in relationship to those things. The new rite tends to have more deprecatory prayers where you're asking God to, uh, to cause the demon to leave and things of that sort. Um, and so I think that that change is uh, that using more deprecatory than imprecatory prayers is what's why it's actually more efficacious. Does the, old, does the new rite work? Yeah, with some demons it can actually be even more effective in the sense that some demons are relate, well, uh, affected more by prayers were asking God the person to be liberated rather than commanding the demon to leave. So, but that is very few and far between. It doesn't happen too often, and I've only seen it in just a few cases. It's usually more commanding the demon to leave or commanding the demon to do something which causes him to leave. Mm -hmm. One of the main publications that you've authored is your magnum opus, An Introduction to the Science of Mental Health a good portion of which is a review of the principles of St. Thomas and various philosophical distinctions before treating on the problems in the human psyche. Now, today, modern psychology would look at phenomena and exorcism cases and say, well, it's all psychological, and not a few priests and bishops likewise. It's all in their head. Right. Right? So is there a connection between psychology and possession? Well, the relationship um, there is in this sense... Um, well, first, let me just back up. People's psychological difficulties relate to diabolic influence in three ways. The first is that there's nothing psychologically wrong with a person at all. So you can have somebody who's possessed, and while the demon is hijacking them, they will act like they've got psychological illnesses because demons can mimic or be the cause of every form of psychological illness. Now, I'm not suggesting that every psychological illness is, in fact, diabolic, because it's clearly not the case. But you can have um, the demons mimicking that when, the person, when, they're, when they're manifesting, or the demon can um, constantly pick at the person psychologically, so that once you get the demon out, the person is psychologically sound, and they don't even need any therapy, they don't need to really heal from anything, they're fine once you, once you just get him out. <clears throat> 
Then there's those whose problem is entirely psychological. Um, and so, for example, one exorcist had a case where um, the woman thought she was possessed, and all it was is she was just imagining things. So she would see, she would put clothes in the dryer, and when the um, exhaust uh, tube would move from the thing, she would say the demons are in the, in the exhaust tube, mm. right? So you can have people whose problems are purely psychological. There are also certain kinds of schizophrenia where, uh, or a psychosis, sorry, where people will hear voices um, and they will say, you know, the person's possessed. Hearing voices, you can, they, there are parts of the brain can auditorily, um, people can hear auditory hallucinations when the brain breaks down. And so, um, and they can pinpoint that. And it's, it's pretty clear because when it's an auditory hallucination, it tends to either be incoherent or it tends to be things which demons are not interested in even talking about, um, you know, like voting Republican or something like that. <laughs> So it doesn't have anything to do with it doesn't have anything to do with uh, anything that's diabolic, but then there are, but most people that you deal with that do have some form of possession, it's a mixture where the demon has picked at them and caused them to be wounded, or the person themselves has been wounded by a traumatic event, like they've been raped, molested, or um, physically or psychologically abused, and that was the open door by which the demon got in, and so he picks at that, and so not only do they have to go undergo exorcism, but they also need the help of um, a sound psychologist or a priest like myself who knows the psychology well enough to be able to help them to be able to do that. And so um, it's, uh, so, that, so there's that. So to answer your question about, you know, maybe it's just all, isn't it all just psychological? Well, here's the difficulty. Again, we're back to the principle of sufficient reason. Now, the formal formulation of the principle of sufficient reason is the existence of a, of a thing is accountable either in itself or in another. So, and the colloquially we say you can't give what you don't have. Now, what that means is, is that if you look at those three things that I mentioned before, like speaking languages they've never heard or, say, um, you know, changing shape or levitating or things like that, these are not the types of things that are within human capacity to do. Human nature doesn't give us the capacity to do these things. As a result of that, you cannot say that it's psychological because it's beyond the hurt. If it was psychological, it would be within the capacity of human nature to cause or to replicate, um, or it would actually be a breakdown of human nature. But in these particular cases, it's not. So you can't, and this is one of the things that, you know, psychologists, um, even now, who are taking a more objective look are starting to look at this and stuff and say, you know, this isn't a, a psychological issue. This is a, a diabolic one. So one of the cases that I had, um, it was brought to me by a psychologist who had seen a preternatural occurrence where a woman's eyes had changed colors. So you can't, uh, this is not something that human beings can cause. So psychologists, many good ones who are just trying to get to the truth, they're not interested in perpetuating, um, you know, people on their hook like Freud used to call their his um, patients goldfish because you'd get them on the hook and you wouldn't really help them and you'd just bilk them. And they're just, these are people who are honest, trying to do the right thing. They may not have a full um, anthropology or understanding of psychology, but they, they want to know what the truth is and they're seeing things that they realize this is not within human capacity to do. And very often they're coming to us, asking us for help. Them and medical doctors and professionals are now starting to be a bit more open to this, which is good, I think. Mm. Now, here's a question. What does theology tell us about how the intellect functions in hell for both the damned and the demons? Well, we do know that in hell, uh, nobody in hell has the uh, has right reason if you're talking about human beings that are there. Um, and in the case of demons, demons, however, are a different matter. With demons, because all their knowledge is infused, they are not capable of of being in error about those things which are infused. So the demons in hell actually have the understanding of the truth, whereas people who are mentally ill very often aren't in contact with reality. They don't understand what's going on in reality, etc. There's something in their mind that's affecting their judgment, so they don't understand the truth of it. Whereas demons don't suffer from that. What they suffer from is a will that is a complete contrast to their intellect. That's why they're kind of split down the middle in their very being, where their intellect is knowing the truth, but their will is hating it. So there's this kind of interior self-conflict at all times. That doesn't mean that demons can't lie and tell you there are certain things, because they also know this is the truth, and they can move, um, they can 
move people to um, to think things that are false and things of that sort. So it's that that's not the question. But lying is in the will. That's <laughs> contrary to what's in the intellect. Correct, exactly. So demons can do that. So, but demons don't. But however, in hell, human beings, on the other hand, because their judgment is fallible, they actually suffer from mental illness in hell. And the reason we know that is because of the fact that they are fixated on the thing of their sin, and that they are, and that they're constantly um, uh, judging things in light of that. That this is better, etc. Whereas demons know that the sin that they committed, that actually what they did was wrong, and that it would have been better if they had done other things, but they're still in their will holding on to it, so it's an attachment on the side of the demon. Mm-hmm. When human beings get their bodies back after the resurrection, everybody's resurrected, so the dam will also be resurrected. But be right in this life, we have rational control, provided that we're um, sane. We have rational control of our imagination, our memory, and our lower faculties. In hell, they will have no control or, or very little control over, and that control is really only ordered towards their suffering, but they have, in large part, very little or no control over their emotions, their imagination, and things of this sort. The demons will be able to afflict those, and so that in hell, they will actually suffer per- perfect mental illness. They won't be able to um, uh, correct those lower faculties by seeing things in a proper way, except those, except those things that pertain to their punishment or those things which have been revealed to them. Mm. Let's shift gears away from the practicalities in the particulars of exorcism. If one peruses Facebook, blogs, or you just read and listen to the news, one gets the impression that all rational discourse in society is just breaking down. All right, we're talking about shutting down businesses for not making wedding cakes for gay weddings, for instance. The Synod and the Family and various German bishops are talking about mercy. to really means sin doesn't matter and the, the wonderful benefits of homosexual life. There are hundreds of thousands of dead civilians in Iraq and Afghanistan as a result of American military intervention. And people who might otherwise be decent people just shrug their shoulders and say, eh, hey, they're Muslims. Human suffering doesn't really matter to me. Let's go back to the latest reality show or sports. And but at the same time, ignore members of their family and take selfies on their cell phones. And and then you just see the insanity of new you know, a woman runs over her husband because he didn't do this a certain way. A husband kills his wife for kids because of this weird thing. So someone said something they didn't like. And this woman kills a person in public because he looked at her the wrong way. Right. Um, you see, this all rational discourse and behavior in society just seems to be breaking down. Is hell taking over in this life? Yes, insofar as the more sinful a person or a culture becomes the more they come under the order that is in hell, and so it becomes more like hell, literally. Now, not to belabor the answer too much, but in my book on psychology, I talk about how in sin, we know the truth because we make an act of conscience that this thing is is sinful. But St. Thomas says that you cannot will evil for itself. The will can only choose the good, either the, the truly good or the or something under the aspect of the good. So what happens is, is when the conscience is made, the act of conscience is made, that you know, say for example, uh, a, a, I see a woman's purse, and I just, I think to myself, I could steal it because there's jewels in the purse. What happens is the conscience makes, yeah, but stealing is theft, and that makes it evil. That's presented to the will. The will then moves the intellect to, because it can't will to steal, until it ignores that part that it's bad, because it can't will the evil. So it moves the intellect to consider the thing and remove the fact or the reality of the fact that this is belongs to someone else. And when it does that, it meets the definition of violence. The nature of the intellect is to know the truth. Violence is defined as action contrary to the nature of a thing. And whenever you act, cause violence on a thing, you weaken it. And so what happens is, is every time we move the intellect to consider something contrary to the reality. We are literally separate, disconnecting ourselves from reality and acting in a way that's contrary to reality. If we do that habitually, eventually our intellect will just do that on its own and it will ignore the fact that this is theft and think it's okay. 
St. Thomas talks about this mechanism in the case of fornication. At first, the person knows fornication is immoral, but then, uh, a particular example I like to use, Bessie Sue, who's very beautiful, walks in, and then he thinks, well, in this particular instance, it's okay, or he judges it and that he, you know, that he wants the pleasure over the good of following his conscience. Over the course of time, if he keeps doing that, eventually the intellect will be habituated to judge that fornication is okay. So you go from a state where he thinks that it's immoral, which is in, uh, which is in contact with reality, down to the point where he thinks it's okay, which is disconnected from reality, and then eventually he thinks it's good and it should be done. We saw this very thing happen in our own culture over the course of the last five decades, where in the 50s people knew generally that fornication was immoral. In the 60s, with the free love thing happening, over the course of time our culture now has come to embrace it, and they actually think that people are imprudent or unwise, this is how far we've fallen, if they don't live together before they get married. Because they say, well, you have to try it out to see if it's going to work first. So you have, so they become disconnected from reality. In my book, I define mental illness as um, a habit of mind or uh, something in the mind which makes it unable to make right judgment. Right, ju right judgment is what puts me in contact with reality. When I judge rightly, I know the reality of the situation. If I judge wrongly, I don't know the reality of the situation. As people commit sin, they're literally causing the mind to become weak and act contrary to its nature, and they're literally becoming mentally ill. So in our culture, as it's become more and more sinful, the culture is breaking down to the point where people are losing their ability to think rationally. And you even see this. If you take somebody, your average person in our culture, now this isn't an absolute. There are some people who are still to have natural virtue, they're trying to lead a decent life, and you can reason with them, and you can present to them a syllogism, and they'll follow it, and they'll say, that's right, that's the conclusion, and then they'll follow the truth. But a lot of people, because they're habituated to not following the truth, not following to reality, what's happening is, is that you can't, unless it's given to them in a short sound bite, because that's what they're used to watching things on TV, unless it appeals to the emotions, which again can affect our judgment, because they are used to habituated to following their emotions, and we, they're training them even in schools, where Johnny, they'll say things like, you know, Bessie has two mothers. How do you feel about that? Rather than, what do you think? What is the truth of this situation? Instead, they move it to feelings. What ends up happening is, is the kid gets trained to consulting his emotions, which of course are completely out of control, which leads to further mental illness. So what's happening is, is you can't discuss a lot of topics with people because their appetites have become so disordered, they've become mentally ill, literally. And now you give people the example, I said this to a group of psychologists a couple of years ago, I said, look, if a sign that our fact that our culture is descending into insanity, literally, is by the virtue fat by the very fact of gay marriage if 50 years ago you took a man off the street and you said i think two men should be able to live together and get married um they would look at you like you need they, they would probably call the police and have you hauled off to a mental institution because it was so contrary to the reality of the nature of this thing well Today, the fact that people accept this regularly is a sign that they're not thinking rationally. And so when you try and approach, and they're habituated that way, so that when you do speak with them rationally, one of two things happens. Either they just, you get this visceral response where they just get this flood of emotion, they're angry with you, and et cetera, and they think you're evil because you're trying to follow reason, or they have suspicion. People are actually suspicious of the intellectual who follows right reason and follows a pattern of syllogistic reasoning and trying to obtain the truth. They're suspicious of him because, granted, in the past, some intelligent guys have used sophistical reasoning to convince people of things. That's true. But now, today, people are just suspicious or reject out of hand conclusions that would follow from reason rather than from emotion, which is a clear sign of mental illness. Mm. Well, then, speaking of that question of gay marriage, <clears throat> today they'll say, well, we, we, we've just evolved necessarily beyond our biases. You know, it used to be that interracial marriage was considered a sin, although that's actually a, a, has a historical beginning and end in the creation of the doctrine of racism to justify the slave trade. Right. It didn't happen before then. Blacks used to intermarry in Europe for centuries, uh, but nevertheless. Right. Um, but they say, 
Well, they said interracial marriage was a sin, and that black people were inferior to, to white people, you know, which is based on this infinitesimally microscopical point of DNA of difference between black and white people. But nevertheless, they used to argue that, and cogently and on reason, old principles and things like that. And people got over their biases. We had the civil rights movement, et cetera, et cetera. So isn't gay marriage just the latest manifestation of getting over our biases, getting over our, our past pre prejudices and such things? Well... Uh, I think that the argument would be true if there wasn't a thing called the natural law. Human beings are designed and structured a certain way. Now, I know that modern scientists are saying that we can make human beings into anything they want, but time and time again, they've been proven that that is actually false. One of the most clear indications was there was a, um, a young boy who they circumcised. They used too much power in the instrument of circumcision and ended up burning off um, his... Uh, the uh, his member his member and so what happened was is he was told by psychologists it's okay you can raise him as a girl we'll give him hormone treatments and you can raise him as a girl it's not a case of nature it's a case of nurture and so he will he'll grow up and be a happy girl right what ended up happening is quite the opposite when he was younger he had an attraction to the GI Joe toys he was more interested in boy things finally when he was 15 years old I think it was he went to his mom and said, there must be something wrong with me because he thought he was a girl because they had always taught he was a girl. He said, you know, I think there's something wrong with me because I'm attracted to girls. And then that's when his mom said, no, actually, you were born a boy. And so there is, a, there is built into us, and we're even seeing this with the brain studies. They're showing that men and women, for example, their brains are structured differently. Human beings have a definite structure, which means that the natural law it, the nature of the thing is designed one way, and so we know what the will of God is. We know what is right and proper to human beings based upon how we're structured and what we're properly uh, inclined to based upon that nature, not the sinful inclinations, which can incline us to things that are disordered and contrary to our nature, but that's because of the fact of original sin. But the fact is, is that we are designed and structured a certain way. And so as a result, you can't just say, well, this is just a new evolution and those kinds of things because human nature doesn't change. The more, in fact, what's happening, really, if you look at it, is the more that they're saying things are changing, actually, the more they're really remaining the same. What we're discovering is, is that people who they say, you know, have these, have certain kind of proclivities, and so we need to be accepting of them, et cetera, and so like that. In the end, if that were true, if it was natural, then their nature would function properly the way it was designed, and so they would be a happiness, a certain contentment, a certain interior peace and order. And these people are not happy. They're not uh, um, have, experiencing that fulfillment of their nature. They're very become wounded for these things, etc., because it's contrary to our nature again. So the fact of the matter is, is that human nature is designed a certain way, and uh, we because it's designed a certain way. If we act contrary to that, it's just going to lead to more mental illness, more difficulties, um, and more societal breakdown. Mm. Absolutely fascinating. Now, you also hold a PhD in philosophy. In your estimation, what is the state of philosophy in the church today, both in regard to the clergy and the laity? Um, I think that you know, just to back up to do a little bit of history. After the shift away, after the Second Vatican Council, away from Thomism to um, more modern philosophical discourse, <coughs> one of the things that kind of came up to the fore was phenomenology, especially because of John Paul II's um, affinity for it. Since John Paul II's death, there's been a, I, in my, from what I've seen, there seems to be quite a bit of a decline even in the relationship to phenomenology. And I think that generally philosophy um, is uh, generally, it's still kind of declining. And in fact, I don't think there's a whole lot of people doing a whole lot of real, um, you know, cut, uh, cutting edge work in philosophy, so to speak. One thing I am noticing, though, is, is that there are some, especially the younger people, they're, they find that the modern philosophy is unsatisfactory, and so the, a lot of them are picking up the Thomism slowly, and as they're trying to recoup the tradition of the church or they're trying to f discover the truth, what they're finding is is that it's most best e uh, explicated 
in the um, churches uh, that the, the philosophies of the church used to espouse before rather than the newer philosophies. And so as a result, they're picking those back up. And so uh, among it's, it's starting to re-germinate, so to speak. I think it's starting to come back up again um, in certain areas. But um, I think still generally um, philosophy is a bit of in a decline. You know, one of the real problems, too, is, is that you see that because of the fact that theologically, um, philosophy was always called the handmaid of theology. And the reason being is because how you um, determine um, certain philosophical things like definition of terms or what your worldview was philosophically would very often determine your theological uh, outlook and how you're going to approach theology, how you reason philosophically, those habits of thinking and habits of proceeding methodologically were taken uh, mutatis mutandi that is changed for the for this, the, the object of theology which is God it was it was approached that way and so um, the advanced was or how you did theology was very heavily dependent on philosophy what I'm finding is that a lot of people are trying to recoup the theology but without having the strong philosophical foundation and as a result of that it's um, the theology is kind of picking back up, but I think before we ever really get to that real clear, really well done, really well reasoned um, theology, uh, two things is going to have to happen. One is the recouping of the tradition, obviously, but the second one is a strong philosophical foundation is going to have to be reestablished in order for that to really to really get off the ground. Mm. So, with respect to the tradition and philosophy, which tend to follow Saint Thomas. Um, some people will say, well, St. Thomas isn't the end-all and be-all. There, there's more to philosophy than the quinquedia and to, to mystic metaphysics. We need to branch out to the peripheries of human experience to have any true philosophy. In other words, do we need St. Thomas today? Well, I think even St. Thomas would say, that you're, I mean, which is what he did, he took all the philosophers and took whatever was true and good out of them and synthesized it into a coherent system. Now, philosophy, the definition of philosophy is it's the science and study of nature, the natures of things. That being the case, the philosophy that is that best explicates the natures of things is the one that you want to follow. Now, in modern philosophy, starting with Descartes, going through Kant, and even into the phenomenology, you're not really ever get to the nature of things. In fact, you're cut off from the nature of things epistemologically. And so as a result, you're not really going to get to the nature of things. And in a certain sense, some have even questioned whether most of the modern philosophy is even philosophy at all, really. But if you're, t if you're looking at it from, from that particular perspective. So the, my basic observation is it's true that there has been some work done, you know, in the last four or 500 years that can be integrated into a coherent system. But you still have to have a system that's coherent and does give an accurate understanding of the natures of things. Thomism is that system. It was, in fact, it, it's kind of funny because one of the criticisms of Thomism before the council was, well, it was too simplistic. It's basically common sense philosophy. Well, first of all, if that's your criticism, it's hardly a criticism. In fact, it's a compliment. Common sense, the definition of common sense is the ability to grasp the nature of a thing. That's, that's what common sense actually is. So, for example, one time my brother-in-law and I, were, we pulled up, he was, we were in his SUV, we pull up to a gas station. A woman is pumping gas with a cigarette in her hand. In the same hand, she's pumping the gas. Obviously, a complete lack of common sense. Why? Because she doesn't understand the nature of cigarettes in relationship to a flammable, a flammable thing. So the point being in all of this is, is that Thomism is one of those systems that gives us the best understanding of nature, it, uh, of natural things. It gives the essences of those things. It gives us uh, a coherent system. And so from that coherent system, then from there, you can continue to develop it. St. Thomas would never say that he is the, the end all of everything. But I would argue that Thomism has to be at least the foundation of what you're going to do and anything that you do that would any kind of philosophizing that would be at variance with the core principles of St. Thomas and the, and the core philosophy of St. Thomas um, is probably inaccurate or wrong and so that he, he kind of becomes a kind of a standard or a gauge and the philosophical advance among Thomas even in the last century 
any of the stuff that was done that really advanced and really gave us a greater understanding was always based on St. Thomas. St. Thomas is the foundation. Even if you're going to do more, he's the foundation for it. Mm -hmm. Do you believe it was correct for the 1917 canon law to require all philosophical study to conform to the mind of St. Thomas? And should this be reestablished in some fashion today? Because you can have a wide variety of those who say they're, they're to the mind of St. Thomas, to distinctions between, say, Garigou Lagrange and Gilson, or to uh, you know, figures like Rahner or, or Lonergan, who are considered Thomists, but certainly you know, go in, in far different directions. Uh, I definitely think it was correct that the 1917 Code required it for this reason. As I mentioned, your philosophical outlook on, on, on your worldview, on the natures of things, and how you structure things philosophically is going to determine how you're going to proceed theologically, and also it's going to, it's going to affect certain things theologically. So, for example, if you are um, only going to follow Plato, which, by the way, I'm a fan of Plato. I just think he's one of those guys you have to see him um, in, in, within the limitations in which he was working. But the fact is that if, if you're going to be purely platonic, you're going to very easily end up in Gnosticism, which we saw in the history of the church. So the point being is, is that your philosophy is going to determine your theology. So the church, in recognizing that St. Thomas gave an accurate um, and healthy understanding of the worldview and things of that sort, required it so that the theology would be preserved and would actually advance. And so if you stay, if you stay within Thomism as the foundation, both of the philosophy and the theology, because what St. Thomas is doing with the theology is just uh, unpacking or explicating the various doctrines of the church in a way that's thoroughly Catholic. So you don't have to, uh, or you, it's, it's important to maintain that as the foundation. Should it be done today? Well, I think it is being recouped today because I think that even the younger clergy, some of them, are seeing the necessity of recouping Thomism for having a better understanding of it. Um, a priest who's a friend of mine said one of the big turning points for him in theology was when they actually he actually studied the Secunda Pars of St. Thomas question by question with the professor. Because once he saw that, he got the intellectual habits, it gave him a framework, and from them his whole theological um, knowledge deepened. So I think that it's a necessary thing. I think it has to be recouped. It is still required study, um, even in the church's current documentation, it's just that it's largely ignored. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And it is a historical note, uh, St. Robert Beller Bellerman, my listeners know, of course, I'm on everything Bellerman is and trying to translate his corpus. Um, at one time, when he started, <clears throat> the normal course, even for the Jesuits, was the sentences, a commentary on the sentences of Peter Lombard. Right. And Bellerman told all his students, well, dispense with this. Read the Summa, and you'll make far more advancement with this than you will with the sentences. Yeah, I think that's generally correct. And actually, even St. Thomas's commentary on the sentences, which is um, the work he had to do to get his doctorate, is, um, you know, many of the things that he deals with in there are just right in the Summa, and it's, it's, the, uh, it's a fantastic work. Um, the other thing is, too, is that even even the best of theologians, like St. Alphonsus Liguri, people say, well, I don't need to read St. Thomas, I'll just read St. Alphonsus Liguri. Well, the fact of the matter is, is that the foundation, the core of Alphonsian uh, moral theology is Thomistic. So if you're going to ignore Thomas or not or reject Thomas, but then become a, a study of Alphonsus, you're basically throwing out the very foundation of, of St. Alphonsus. So this is something that I think is... Is, a, is kind of a misnomer. And the greatest theologians, as you, you, know, as you kind of pointed out, throughout the, um, after St. Thomas were all those who rooted themselves in St. Thomas. Mm. You're known f among other works for your, your uh, articles in Latin Mass Magazine, as well as uh, your more recent books on the binding force of tradition, as well as magisterial authority, both of which we'll have linked in the episode notes here. Would you say there's a crisis of authority in theology today? Yes, and I think that the crisis of theor theology stems, this is my own personal opinion, but I think it stems from two things. First is the general onslaught of modernist um, theology, which is rooted in modern philosophy, where the standard for what is true is disconnected from reality and transposed into the individual so that the criteria of truth is interior rather than exterior to us. That being adopted by the modernists, 
it means that no one is an authority. You're an authority unto yourself. We saw this problem with the, we still see it with the Protestants, who they're their own authority, and they say, well, the Holy Spirit speaks to me interiorly. Well, the problem with that is, okay, then why is everybody misinterpreting it? Uh, scripture and things of that sort, why are you all disagreeing? But the point being is, is that uh, the uh, crisis of authority starts, so it started with the modernist thing where they basically rejected the uh, authority of the magisterium and took the you know took themselves up as the authority figures. You even see this even with some of the Pariti, the Second Vatican Council, and even afterwards, where you know the magisterium is ignored completely. It's just you, they just do their own theology on the side without any um, whether it has to be connected to the magisterium or not is purely incidental. But the that there's that. But then there was something on a historical note in, um, that I think was very important. John the Twenty Third said that um, when they were getting ready for the Second Vatican Council, he said, "We will allow any intervention done at the Second Vatican Council, regardless of how progressive." The difficulty with that is, is that he stopped exercising his authority. Part of which is to police the doctrinal integrity of those things taught within the church and uh, with, of those people of the church and through the magisterium. Once that happened, um, and the theologians said they could get up there and say anything they wanted. They themselves put themselves, because authority is like nature, it abhors a vacuum. They put themselves in that position of being the one to whom people would go, the, the moral authority in this particular case, or the psychological authority. And as a result, that the whole authority issue kind of collapsed. Now, what's happening is, is even as we're trying to recoup the tradition, you know, many traditionalists have had to fight to keep their faith to keep the faith of their children. And so as a result, they've had to tell their children at times, don't listen to that bishop, don't listen to that um, priest, because what he's saying is contrary to the faith. The problem is that, that, that um, while that is true, and they did have to do that, they still have to recognize that, but the authority is still invested. Even if they don't make use of it, um, they still have to recognize that that's where the authority is. And I think that until there is um, a, a prawns that have the authority from Christ, the magisterium, but then second, what the limits of those, that authority is, until those two things are properly understood, there will be, a, there'll continue to be a crisis of authority. You mentioned parents that have to tell their children, don't listen to this priest or bishop or what have you. There's, there's many people who have the feeling that, well, I'm not a theologian and I don't really know much beyond some basic catechism. Do I need to master all these theological distinctions just in order to keep my Catholic faith? Right, especially when you, you have priests giving sermons that, well, they, the Israelites didn't really cross the Red Sea. They crossed the Reed Sea. It was only mm -hmm. two, two yes. inches of water. Or uh, Jesus didn't uh, do a miracle to multiply loaves and fishes. He got all the Jews to share and all this other type of nonsense. And, and far worse things, not just from priests, but even from bishops or even from members of the magisterium. And you know, do you have to be an expert theologian to keep the faith? No. Ultimately, you can be an expert theologian and then end up losing your faith. Mm -hmm. Faith is a gift, you know, it's a theological virtue infused in our intellect, and we can only give uh, assent to it by an act of, by God giving us the grace to do so. So that's the primary thing. But I think that, uh, you know, I, uh, I used to have this uh, kind of the same complaint. I said, we're getting to a stage in our church history where unless you have this tremendous philosophical and theological training at your, at your disposal, you're going to very easily end up in error. One theologian one time said to me, he said, do you think that the default position today is modernism or heresy because it's so pervasive that people are just breathing it in and it's just easy to fall into? And I said, yeah, I do. However, I think the solution is, ironically, um, something that I talk about both in my book on magisterial authority and on the, in the um, book on the binding force of tradition is the Vincentian canon, which is, the standard is what has been taught always, everywhere, and by all. In other words, if the church has always taught this, if it's always been the teaching of the church, then that's what you follow. So you don't have to have this phenomenal um, apparatus. You just have to know what the church has always taught. So that means just knowing the basics of your catechism, knowing the basic things. If people start contradicting scripture, well, the church has always said that the scripture is inerrant, so you just ignore it. But the point being is, is that um, you don't have to have that. You just have to be... Um, you know, follow what the church has always taught, and then at the same time also um, be faithful to those graces of God giving you that. 
On the other hand, there is one thing that I have seen from time to time among certain people, which is they might have been taught something. Well, sister so-and-so taught me when I was a kid that X was the case. When in point and fact, either they didn't get what sister said correctly or what sister said wasn't correct. And so sometimes they think they know the faith and they don't. So they just need to make sure that they read basic catechisms like the Baltimore Catechism or the one that you just put out, which is a really good one, or another one, um, um, or read through the Catechism of the Council of Trent. It can never, the, the church's teaching can never, uh, can never depart from that. And so if, you're, if you understand those well, then you'll, and you always, if you adhere to that, you'll generally speaking be okay. Hmm. Your most prolific article, which is still a stumbling block for many of the neoconservatives, is your artic article, I believe is 2004, in Latin Mass Magazine, where you argued for the superiority of the traditional Latin Mass to the Novus Ordo, speaking uh, in terms of extrinsic celebration, not its intrinsic nature. So it, could you expand a little bit about the, the distinctions of that article? And is this part of the problem in the church today? And if so, how do we solve it? I do think it's part of the problem today, but I, um, but I think that there's a kind of a certain way to approach it. Basically, the article states that there are uh, six areas of merit in a mass or value in a mass. In other words, if you look at the mass, the theologians before the council broke it down to these are the six areas through which we can gain grace and those things necessary for our salvation, etc., through the mass. The first one is the intrinsic merit, which is Christ's sacrifice. So in the new rite and the old rite, they are identical because it's a valid mass. And so if it's a valid mass, then the intrinsic merit is there. And so um, there's always that intrinsic merit as long as it's valid. However, uh, Father Gear says in his book, The Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, he says the the intrinsic merit of the, ma of the Mass, the Calvary sacrifice, is infinite in nature. We know for a fact that it is not applied in an infinite manner. Because if it was applied in an infinite manner, there would be no sin, there would be no evil, there would be everything would automatically be corrected. So the question becomes then, well, then it, we know therefore that it's limited. They call this, um, that it's uh, lim intensive, intensively limited. So how much merit or how much comes from the intrinsic sacrifice to us is mediated in the Mass through the other aspects of merit. And this is a very key point. Now, there's other areas of merit. So, for example, um, the, uh, the priest. So if he's a bishop or, the, um, you know, if he's a bishop, his Mass, by virtue of his public priesthood, um, is going to be more meritorious than, say, just a simple priest. Um, then there is also the holiness of the priest because his part of our merit is if we're in the state of grace, we do a, a good work, we can merit the grace. So the holier the priest, the more we, he can merit. So people can, um, when they go to the priests, uh, a mass said by a really holy priest, they very often will notice they're, they're getting more graces, etc. The other one is the, um, the decora. Those are the things that are external to the mass, uh, the externals in the mass. So uh, mass said with more beautiful music, Mass said with more uh, beautiful uh, instruments of the Mass, like the chalice and things of that sort, you know, those things will actually be more pleasing to God because beauty, by its nature, is pleasing to God. And so as a result, when he sees that, it'll be more pleasing and he's more likely to give us those things. Also, when we put beautiful things into the Mass and into our churches and things of that sort, God recognizes that, we are, that we're trying to give our best to him and so he'll also give us uh, more merit in relationship to that. So the decorum is quite important. So glass chalices are not pleasing to God? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. The last, uh, so then the other area of merit is um, the sanctity of the people that are, that are present at the Mass. So if you have a group of people that are more holy than others, then there's going to actually be more grace coming through that Mass to um, both to the people who are participating and to the general church, etc. The last area the authors talk about, um, which is not, by the way, the last necessarily in, the, in my treatment of it, but the last is the um, actual ritual of the Mass. So taking the fact that it's intensively limited and that from the intrinsic sacrifice, we will gain a certain amount of merit by what we do and what we, you know, the decor, etc., that that will determine the application of that intrinsic sacrifice to us um, in the grace. The other one is the actual ritual. That joined with the principle that prayer begets what it signifies. What you ask for is what you're going to get. I learned this 
in spades when I was uh, as an exorcist. I mean, I always knew the principle, but I didn't see it concrete as concretely as I did when I saw it in um, in exorcism. You will pray, you will ask Christ, Christ do X, and immediately X will happen. And so you see, he's always there, he's always listening. So what you pray for, precisely what you pray for is what he's going to do, even in the exorcism. So if you formulate it one way, he'll do that. If you formulate another, he'll do something else. Now, from time to time, he does step in and do other things to help the case move along. But that's something that's very key. So prayer begets what it signifies, and the intrinsic sacrifice comes through us mediating the extrinsic elements of merit and which is the, the ritual. Therefore, that's why in my, in my article I observe that if you look at the prayers of the old rite, they're structured in a way to gain us certain things that have been removed from the new mass. There's certain structures or certain elements in the old rite where, for example, the priest is confessing his own sin. He's con not just communally, but his own. He's doing certain things. There's this constant humiliation of the priest and of the people, etc. And there's all these things that go into the priest recognizing his own unworthiness and things of that sort. And so uh, when he approaches it, he's more modest, he's more humble, and so he's going to be able to merit more just by the elements that are built into the Mass. The same thing is with the prayers. The prayers, um, in addition to asking for certain things, I tell people, you know, I think one of the biggest mistakes they ever made is that they used to have... Um, prayers said for the Holy Father um, uh, said uh, a commemoration was made for the for the sake of the Holy Father um, at every mass during Lent, and that was removed. And I, I think to myself, well, then if he if we remove that, he's not benefiting from the effects of those prayers. That being said, what happens is if you take a close look at it, then really the old mass is actually gaining more merit for the people and for the um, for the life of the church than the new Mass is if you're looking at those particular things. <clears throat> so that, in, so if, for example, prayers such as you see in some of the collects at Lent, um, they're just extemporaneously translating off the top of my head from one of them, O oh God, you know, thou who sees we who are justly afflicted for our sins, may we attain... <clears throat> would you the which thou deign to give us the merit to do proper penance for them right like versus oh god you're so wonderful is to some of these prayers the new writer they come off this way certainly oh god you're so wonderful grant us to love you more this is something that's very broad, broad in general right. it doesn't give a specific application right in fact that's that's a very good point because saint thomas says that the more specific a prayer is the more efficacious it will generally be mm -hmm. so and this is something that's really important another collect that they or at, at the end there used to be a um a prayer said over the people asking during Lent, asking God for very specific things for the people that was removed, and so now they're not getting the benefits of those prayers. Right. And it was so removed on Sundays. You still see it there at the weekday, the ferial masses. Yes, but I, the, but I think that it's it's uh, I think it's something that if we if you take a, an honest look at it, the other side of it is too is that priests have noticed that when they go from say the new mass to the old mass. There is a change, a deepening in their understanding of the priesthood because it's more sacrificial. They, uh, so their understanding of their priesthood, how they relate to that, their spirituality deepens. There's certain things because of the nature of the prayers are helping us to mm -hmm. kind of understand that. Mm -hmm. And I also, um, uh, I also think that, you know, when God looks at the old mass, he, when he when he sees our particular mass, he's not just seeing that one mass. He is seeing all the masses that were said by the saints who said that same mass, who did that, or substantially the same mass. So for like the Carmelites and the Dominicans, it was substantially the same mass. They're, they're, uh, he's seeing all of that too. And so there's a certain pleasingness that he has with that that he isn't necessarily going to see with the new mass who doesn't have the same number of saints that have said it, etc. Hmm. So now we look at where the traditionalist movement is today and the the push to you know to, to, let's recoup the traditional Latin Mass. Let's recoup the you know the older books. Um, certainly, an effort I've been involved in, like my tr translation of the Canisius Catechism, as well as uh, what I'm working on now with Saint Robert Bellarmine, and and other things. They say this is the solution. We just get everything back the way you know it was in, in decades before the Council. Yes, there were problems before the Council, but you know we need to recover the way things were. Yet, when Our Lady appeared at Fatima in 1917. 
She told the children to pray many rosaries because souls were falling into hell like leaves on the trees. Right. Now, this is in the early 20th century. All women wore skirts. The traditional Latin Mass was said in every Latin Rite church throughout the world. Right. Catechesis was sound. And bishops and priests were not giving sermons about Christ made all the Jews share in the desert and this sort of thing. Uh, the tomfoolery like that. Um, it would seem that everything that traditionalists say we need to reform the church was in vogue. Yet, Our Lady said souls were falling into hell in rapid numbers. Right. Therefore, it would seem that, that, something, that something in the traditionalist program for reform is lacking. What, what else has to happen? I think that a few things has to happen, but primarily it has to be people have to lead a life of grace and virtue. It's not just enough that you have the Mass. You have to lead a life of grace and virtue. One of the areas of merit is the sanctity of the people. If the people are very worldly or wed to the world or if they're, uh, uh, or if they're not leading good lives or if they're proud, the God resists the prayers of the proud. So, as it says in the Old Testament, so that being the case, if they're not approaching the Mass in humility and in charity to their neighbor and all those things, if, not, if they don't have those things in place, they're not going to reap the benefits of the Mass. It's just not going to happen because we don't receive the benefits um, for the Mass if we're, if we're proud or if we're, if we're not leading good lives and we're not taking the necessary means. The Church also, um, I mean, obviously there has to be other devotions, but if they don't change dispositionally, then that can be a problem. And one of the real problems, I think, in the traditional movement is people have this idea, well, I go to the traditional Latin Mass, therefore I'm better than you. Well, it's true that the Mass is better. That doesn't make you better. What makes you better is benefiting from the Mass by... You know, working on humility, working on and not being proud, not thinking you're better than everybody else. In fact, every saint always thought that they were the worst of sinners. So if you're really, you know, better than everybody else, you'd actually think you're worse than everybody else. Um, so the point being is, is that people have to have a dispositional change interiorly because until that happens, um, the tradition, I think, will flounder not only on the side of the receiving the grace, but also on the side of attracting people because you can get... Um, you know, people going to the traditional Latin Mass faithfully, but they're very mean to the people who come there for the first time or what have you, and then the people leave. So if, if charity doesn't rule, and if humility doesn't rule, and if the other virtues aren't in place, um, having all that other things in, in, in place isn't going to um, have that much of an impact. Mm -hmm. There is an expression, people get the leaders they deserve. Mm -hmm. And with uh, with a lot of bishops that certainly don't seem to be very friendly to the tradition, to put it mildly, or um, with the election of uh, Pope Francis, who appears to be more on the progressive side. We'll put it that way. And a lot of traditionalists have been amiss about various things he's done or said. Right. Having heard the confessions in traditional communities, would you say that traditionalists are getting the leaders they deserve? Uh, yes and no. You know, Part of your other question was, you know, these things were in place before the council. What happened? I think if you read carefully the history before that, there was a collapse in people's morals lives. And as a result, this is one of the reasons why we're at where we're at. This is one of the reasons why. Um, so one of the things that before the council, the fact that the people weren't leading good lives is, is why things kind of collapsed, and which is why we ended up with um, a lot of bad priests. One of the things we learned in the Old Testament is you do get the leaders you deserve. One priest rightly pointed out, you also get the leaders you want. So sometimes when people aren't leading good lives, they want specific kind of leaders, and those are the ones that actually will lead them down a bad, very bad path. But as far as the, the um, leaders we deserve, if, if the traditionalists are going to have really good and holy priests, they themselves are going to have to uh, become good and holy, but they're also going to have to pray for the priests because priests are humans. They're subject to... Um, diabolic attack, they're subject to human frailty, and so unless they're praying for them and getting the grace for them, they're just not, it's not going to happen. On the other hand, there are certain priests that are being given to the traditional movement, to the church in general, that are very holy, and that's because God still wants the preservation of the church. The final end of the church is everybody's holiness and sanctity, their salvation, which consists ultimately in holiness. So that being the case, God is always going to provide certain holy leaders, but that, and generally speaking, which, what leaders we have in the church is going to be proportionate to how holy of a people that we are. The other thing is, too, is, and this is just kind of comes by way of warning, 
one of the things we learned in the Old Testament, and actually in the passing of the New Testament from the Jews to uh, not just the Jews but the Gentiles as well, is if you abuse a gift that's given to you from God, he's going to take it from you and give it to somebody else. So if you're being abusive of the grace that God gives you to see the truth of the traditional movement, the beauty of the old mass, but at the same time you're abusing it by beating up on people in an uncharitable way rather than giving constructive criticism and helping them along intellectually, God's going to take it from you and give it to somebody else. So you have to be very careful about that. Mm. Okay, and the last question then, are the material benefits we enjoy today a hindrance to, to proper Catholic spirituality? For example, Catholic social teaching holds that economics exists for families to acquire the necessary goods to attain their final end, which is heaven. Yet today, we, we have the ability to get whatever we want, even when monetarily poor. If you want to want meat, you go to the supermarket. Even in the past, you would have only gotten meat you know, once, once or twice a week. If you want some fixture or furnishing, you order it on Amazon or eBay, and it comes made via sweatshop labor in China or wherever. Trads often look to life right after World War II and say, that is God's country. That's where we need to be. And, you know, whether the, the coming together of the, where you had all this money people had because they couldn't spend it during the war because of rationing, add to that the GI Bill, Social Security, all these, you know, new, new means where the money is kind of flowing to get whatever you want in that generation, which trickles down to us. And does the confluence of the abundance of goods in the means to acquire them actually frustrate the purpose of economic activity in the Catholic tradition, which is to attain our final end? That's a good question, not in themselves, but in relationship to us who have fallen human nature. In other words, these things are good. The problem is, is that fallen human nature is such that unless it develops virtue, which moderates those things, it will end up having that problem where it frustrates us because we become so focused on the things of this life. My father once said to me, he said, unless you raise a man somewhat lean he will end up useless. And by that, he was basically saying that he was noticing that the kids today who get everything they want all the time, they have no motivation, they, they have no um, virtue in a certain sense, is basically what he was saying. One of the difficulties, I write a little bit about this in my article called The Sixth Generation, where I talk about, uh, which appeared in the Latin Mass magazine, where I talk about that the greatest generation that fought World War II they went through the Depression, they went through the Second World War, and when they came out the other end of it, because they had to practice all that self-denial, and, and there was all these things that they wanted but they couldn't have, when they came out the other end of that, because they, they basically succumbed to a spirit of unwilling to suffer or a lack of mortification. And so as a result, you see this in how they raised their uh, their children, the hippie generation, where they, they didn't discipline them as much as they should have, they didn't... Uh, um, they let them just kind of go off wild. They indulge them too much with too many things. And as a result, the, they, they ended up falling into the free love thing and all of that. So the difficulty really boils down to the fact that when goods are too plentiful for human beings in the state of fallen human nature, unless they practice, take on the self-denial themselves, to themselves, they can easily succumb to... Uh, taking their joy and all those things just purely the material things rather than the material things being a means to their final end, as you rightly point out. This is uh, one of the things which I noticed in, there's a philosopher by the name of Vogelin, and he says that technology is a good thing, and any time we use technology, we get a certain pleasure out of it. As a result, if we don't do some type of penance or some type of mortification after its use, we will end up becoming intemperate and immoderate in relationship to the things of technology. And you see this. People are constantly feeding the pleasures they get out of the tech use of technology. But it's also true in relationship to food and all those other things. In fact, you know, most people today eat better than some of the kings did in the past. It's, mm -hmm. And, you know, again, is that bad? No. It, in itself. But it can be bad in the sense when people are constantly feasting. Uh, G.K. Chesterton has that line, if you, can't, if you can't fast, you can't feast, and if you can't feast, you can't fast. And basically what he's pointing out there is, is that if you, don't pra if you can't practice self-denial in relationships to these things, you're going to detract from the actual feast, from the actual enjoyment of those things. But it also is a sign that the fact that the person is intemperate. And I think in our culture, that unless we start practicing self-denial in relationship to these things, 
and start doing penance and start doing those things to get those virtues in place, we're going to end up in a very dissipated society, which we actually are. It's just getting worse, where there is practically no virtue. Um, one uh, priest who's an exorcist who taught, uh, who taught me some of the things that I know as an exorcist, gave me some of my training, um, he, uh, he pointed out, you know, the difference, if, if there's something that really bad were to happen now, the difference between now and, say, if it would have happened 100 years ago, is he said the people 100 years ago had sufficient virtue to be able to hunker down and deal with it and it not drive them insane. Today, people are so wedded to their goods and to their lifestyle and lack such virtue. Uh, and I'm not exaggerating this. I'm convinced, like, say, for instance, if the cell phone structure infrastructure went down and you couldn't text, you'd have people committing suicide, literally, because they couldn't text their friend, you know, all the time. And I think that this is one of the real dangers. So to answer your question is, yes, it is bad for us if we don't have virtue. If we have virtue, then these things can actually benefit society greatly. One of the signs we don't have virtue is, is um, in the book um, by a Joseph Pieper called Leisure, the Basis of Culture, he says the reason God gives people a certain affluence and a certain leisure, now leisure doesn't mean that you just sit around doing nothing, but the freeing up from all the, the grind that was normally required in just eking out an existence, the reason God gives that is so that we can develop higher virtues. In our culture, we are not developing the higher virtues. You know, things like um, the, 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 the enrichment of the arts in a true art sense, or the um, developing mag uh, magnanimity and magnificence where we help either the poor or we create great edifices, you know, like the churches. The churches today are generally speaking, they're being built or ugly and they're done on the cheap and they don't want any debt or they don't want to take the time. You know, in the past, cathedrals would take anywhere from, you know, 50 to 120 years to build. People aren't willing to do that. They just want it immediate right now. And so as a result, there's that magnificence isn't being manifested. And people who have money, they think that the money is there to accumulate it for themselves rather than to do these great things. So I think that if we don't, with all these good things, that unless we start practicing virtue and self-denial, our culture is just going to continue to plummet and continue to dissipate. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Father Ippiger, where can people find more of your work? Um, well, there is. Um, there's uh, The primary place is on the press called Census Traditions Press. Um, they can go to that on the internet, and um, m a lot of the things that we've talked about are contained in books with greater um, explication. There's a lot more included in there, so they can uh, actually go there. Okay, great. And um, for more audios or... Oh, and, uh, yeah, so now it's for my audios. You can go to uh, my website, which is censustraditionis.org, and go to multimedia. There's all sorts of stuff there. I also have some texts that I've uh, I published online that I, I don't publish anywhere else. People can read those. All right, excellent. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.